Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Windham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Windham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. Vote 2020, we bring you an update on how, where and why you should vote this November. And getting the count right, why Census 2020 matters to you and the services where you live. Plus a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott Smith. The U.S. presidential election is November 3rd and there has been much in the news and the media in general about it. Voting in the election has been complicated with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, with questions raised about whether to vote in person or by absentee ballot. We're joining us is Betsy Barrett, city and town clerk for the city of Norwich. Betsy, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much, Brian, for having me. It's an important year. It's a voting year. The question's quite simple. Why should we vote and how important is it to vote? Well, that's a great question. Uh, Why we should vote? We have been given the right and privilege to vote from our forefathers. It gives us a voice to tell government what we would like them to do for us. We have the ability to decide the quality of life for us and for future generations. So I think that's an important reason to get out and vote. Voting is important because it's your choice. It's not required. I feel it's our civic responsibility to go and vote. You'll have your voice heard. Remember, every vote counts. We decide who, who we elect, which will decide what taxes we pay, what programs we have, things like educational choices, policies, laws, funding. And if we don't vote, that would not be good because we'd probably lose our freedoms in our country and have them taken away. There's a lot of controversy in this year's election. We're not going to get overly political. In fact, we're not going to get political about it. But what I do want to understand from you as obviously a city and town clerk is about the voting process, because that's what's been in the media quite a bit. And I think there's still a lot of confusion for people who are trying to understand what they do, when and how. So can you talk us through some of the voting process? I will. And you are right. There are a lot of different new things that are um, available right now. Um, New and old, I should say. So we're talking about the November presidential um, election voting process, which an election year for president is always a high turnout vote year for towns and cities. As we know, We want to be safe and secure and have everybody be safe and secure as they cast their ballots for this very important election. And now with this COVID-19 pandemic around, we do have some changes. There will still be two ways to cast your ballot. One, you can still go to the polls in person. The polls will all be open. You vote at the polling place where you normally voted last year or if you went to the primary at the primary. You will have to wear a mask, follow the six-foot guidelines. The registrar of voters who oversees the polling places with the moderator has made sure that there are guidelines to follow. The six-foot, there will be pens. They'll be washed down after use. The voting booths will be washed down and sanitary after the booths. The poll workers will have masks on. And the polls will be open as normal from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m to ensure that be able to get there. If by chance you cannot make it to the polls on that day, cannot make it at that time, or don't feel that you are comfortable with that, and let me just back up a minute. I I should say, if you don't know where your polling place is, you can look on your town website, call your local registrar or town clerk, and they will help you find your polling place. The second way to cast your ballot for this election is by an absentee ballot. This is what the Secretary of State is now sending out. The applications to over 2.1 million voters will be sent out the week of 
Labor Day. You will get an absentee ballot application in the mail with a return envelope with postage. So we're asking if you would please, if you're going to vote this way, either mail that back to the city clerk that's on the return, which will be a windowed envelope. You can just sign it, make sure you sign it, check the reason why you want an absentee ballot, put it back in that envelope, make sure the window on that envelope is addressed to the city clerk. We've sometimes had problems with it being dressed back to the person. This is unfortunate. They send it back to us, but double check that it's addressed to the city clerk before you drop it in the mail. Or for your security also, we have drop boxes at each and every city hall. So whatever town you belong to, you would drop it in that drop box if you feel more comfortable doing that. They're picked up um, daily, maybe more than once or twice or three times a day. So that's one of the things, is to get that application back to the clerks as soon as possible, because we will have an onslaught this year of applications. Now, one of the things just to be clear about when you said about the drop boxes, obviously a lot of city halls are not open to the public still because of COVID-19. But if people are concerned about delays in the post, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, these drop boxes are outside, as you say, with city halls so that they can effectively all but, you know, return it to the city clerk that way by, you know, personally going to the drop box. Correct. Each town hall has one or more. In Norwich, I have two right now. I'm hoping to get a third. One is at Waquanic School. There's a drop box there. And one of them is in front of City Hall. All the town clerk's offices, 169 towns, have them in front of their town hall. You have to put your ballot application in the town that you live in very important because it's not a postal box it's a drop box specific for that town correct now concerns about post you know putting it in in the mail what's the latest that you are hearing the city of norwich about you know the post office's ability to make sure that you know if these things are returned by traditional mail that they will be received in time and also what advice are you giving to people about how quickly they should be mailing these things as well Good question. So remember, we're only talking about the applications. The applications go out that week of Labor Day. And if you could get them back to the city clerk as soon as possible, we will start getting the ballots ready. The ballots will not go out till October 2nd by law. That's the earliest we can send out ballots. We don't have the ballots as of yet. It hasn't been determined yet who all is on the ballot. We know the Republican and Democrat people, but we don't know the other parties as of yet. So your application is very important to get it in the Dropbox or the mail as soon as possible. And the mail has been working very closely, and I've been working very closely with the postmaster um, in Norwich to make sure our mail is delivered in a timely fashion, even on Saturdays. And again, the thing that we need to be clear about about these postal ballots, and please correct me if I'm uh, giving out uh, incorrect information here, but if they're not, if the actual ballot, not the application, if the actual ballot is not received by a certain point, it will not be counted. Is that correct? Correct. You have up until 8 p.m. to put your ballot in that post box or return it to the city clerk's office on election day, which is November 3rd. They have to be received by the clerk by 8 p.m. on November 3rd. We call the post office late in the day and see if they have any late arrivals. They'll sometimes bring them over. We sometimes pick them up. But it has to be in the clerk's hand by 8 p.m. election night. That's why this drop box is so important that you can put it in as late as you want if it's before 8 p.m. So the ballots don't go out remember, till October 2nd. So the point really to make here to anyone listening is if they're thinking of doing postal voting this year, for whatever reason, that they Mm -hmm. really have to be organized as soon as they see that application, they have to get it back straight away. And then, as you say, then you will be able to get those ballots out on time as well. So everybody really needs to be helping each other here. Correct. Larger cities like Norwich are going to have a huge demand for absentee ballots from the applications. Probably about 60% 
we're assuming are going to vote by absentee and the other probably 20, 25% will vote in person. So we will have a lot of people working to make this process smooth. The post office does have requirements also where they know if it's a ballot, it's to be done quickly and efficiently. And we're all on the same page because every vote counts. I want to put this question to you. It's a bit of a, so like a, a curveball question, so forgive me. But you've been doing this for a long time now. Is this probably one of the most challenging election years from your point of view because of you know COVID and everything else? Yes, it is. As town clerks, we take a real vested interest in making sure that everything is done to the letter and correctly. We don't want anybody to miss out. We don't want to miss anything. We check, we double check, and we make sure that everything is done so every vote is counted. We know how important this is in any election. So we really take our time and make sure everything is done correctly. But it is very challenging because we will have so many more absentee ballots. And, and that's not an easy challenge to do because we get the application, we have to put it into our computer system, then we issue a ballot, we mail it out to you, then you return it to us and we put it back in our system as a double check to say, yes, you only received one ballot, you've only voted once. The names are crossed off on a list, so you can't go to the polls and vote again. So it's a very, very secure process on only one vote per person. You've got a lot of work ahead of you, you and many other town clerks uh, around, obviously, Connecticut and the nation as well. And we are very grateful to have you there, making sure that we have a very safe, reliable, efficient and above all credible election coming up later in the year. Betsy, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and I wish you and everybody who's involved with this process success in what is a very, very challenging year for all of you. Thank you for your time. And can I just do one more important piece? When these, when these absentee ballots come to the people at home, they will see that there are four pieces of mail inside. And it does get a little confusing sometimes. And we won't be there to help them with the instructions. There's an instruction sheet inside. There's your ballot inside. You vote your ballot as you would at the polls. And then there'll be their white or yellow envelope labeled B. It's very, very important you date and sign that envelope and then in, put it into the serial numbered envelope. This is very important that you sign that inner envelope before you put it in the serial numbered envelope because that will ensure that everything will go smoothly. But I thank you also for your time. I thank you for letting me speak. And if anyone has questions, please feel free to call me at the Norwich City Clerk's office. And of course, people can call their city clerks as well, wherever they're listening, obviously for their own town as well, for the same expert advice. Absolutely. We'll take all calls. Any clerk will be glad to take a call. Betsy, again, ever so many thanks. And thank you again for giving us your time on the podcast. Thank you, Brian, very much. Nice talking with you. Apart from the election this year, it's also a census year, and Census 2020 has also been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The short survey, which takes around 10 minutes to complete, is an important survey of everyone living in the U.S. and the services we all use. Jeff Baylor is the New York Regional Director of the U.S. Census Bureau that covers Connecticut, and he joins me now. Jeff, it's good to speak to you. Tell us about the challenges for Census 2020 because of COVID-19. Yeah, we, we certainly have had some challenges, probably the most challenging census that we've ever conducted in this nation. You know, when you look at just things from a health standpoint and uh, the need to change our operational timeline, you know, we were slated to start knocking on doors mid-May, knocking on doors of those households that had yet to respond to their 2020 census, and it, it wouldn't have been safe to do so. So we had to shift our, our operational schedule to the point where we started knocking on doors late July, at the very beginning of August, and we'll continue to do so until the end of September. It's changed the way we, we hire and train people. There's, there's people who applied for these jobs eight, ten months ago and, and are no longer interested because it's, you know, census takers need to be out in the community knocking on doors, having conversations with households to collect that very important information. And we certainly understand for some people it's, it's too much of a risk. So we, we change the way we train people now, uh, even, you know, where it involves some 
mix of classroom training and, and online training. Now it's all online. Uh, we're trying to make it as safe and as easy as possible for anyone who wants to, to work in their community as a census taker. As you've said, you've started door to door. So tell us how that's going. It's going very well. And in fact, in Connecticut, uh, we have some offices as, uh, close to 70 percent done uh, of their workload. We have three offices in, in Connecticut that are out there working great staff within those offices, managers, and supervisors who are uh, hiring and training and onboarding the staff, and then the amazing community members who, who uh, you know, took the oath of confidentiality, accepted this position, and are out there, you know, being a part of history. It's something we do once every 10 years, and, and to say you're a part of that and to really help your community ensure a complete and accurate account. And uh, it's been going excellent in, in Connecticut so far. What about Eastern Connecticut's response? Because rural communities and towns with transient communities have their unique issues. So tell us about those challenges. Yeah, absolutely. You know, rural uh, communities or transient communities are are always a difficult thing uh, to ensure we get uh, accurate data. So, you know, we focus self-response, of course, was our our big drive, trying to get some of those households, get the message out in, in whatever, you know, the best means or mechanism is for those communities, whether it's, you know, hearing something through their church or maybe at the local grocery store or pharmacy, you know, having a sign, a reminder, you know, we're out there at at food distribution sites and COVID testing sites, uh, providing opportunities for the public to fill out their census if they haven't. And our partners, starting with Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz, our congressional delegation, both senators have been absolutely amazing. Our local partners uh, from elected leaders to church leaders to to community-based organizers. Um, they have been doing an amazing job of getting the word out how important the census is to each and every community uh, in Eastern Connecticut and throughout Connecticut. And they really have. And I think that's why you see when you look at the national uh, outlook, you can see Connecticut is in the top tier of states as far as overall response uh, in terms of both self-response and response uh, during our non-response uh, follow-up operation, the knocking on doors. And that's that's due to our partners who have been amazing since day one. There's constant mention about this twenty nine hundred dollars that's lost if the census isn't completed. Explain more to us about that. Yeah, so we we know uh, some partners that, that took a look at the overall data, and there's great reports and studies out there. And I want to stress these aren't census uh, uh, created reports. These are reports done by other partners and private organizations. There's a great study called Counting for Dollars. And they basically looked at what was the total amount of money that came into the state of Connecticut in fiscal year 16 based upon formulas that use census data. And, you know, people are taking that dollar amount and dividing it by the total population to come up with this $2,900 figure. And it certainly, it really varies. That's why the Census Bureau doesn't put out a specific number on an individual because it depends on the program. For instance, national school lunch and breakfast programs, uh, one of the funding programs that receive their funding based upon a formula that uses census data. And of course, it's based upon children. It's not based upon the total population. You look at things like Medicare, Medicaid, you know, that's based upon certain ages of individuals. What we can't lose sight of is just how important it is, regardless of what that dollar figure is, because it is for programs like Medicare and Medicaid and food stamps and TANF and WIC. It's for programs that support our infrastructure from you know, improving our roads, rebuilding bridges and tunnels that need rebuilding. Uh, when we look at parks in our community, community development block grants, all based upon formulas that use census data. When we talk about that education of our children, as I mentioned earlier, national school lunch breakfast programs, Pell grants for college students, Head Start, Title I grants for school supplies, all based upon formulas that use census data. And then finally, I can't think of a better reason as we were talking about COVID-19, look at the strain on our healthcare systems over the past six to to eight months. Let's make sure our healthcare professionals and systems get the funding they deserve because money for hospitals, for hospital beds or supplies for those hospitals, for our emergency personnel, for firehouses and police stations and for ambulances all come from programs that use formulas uh, with census data. And if we don't get a complete and accurate count, we're at risk, the community is at risk of not receiving its fair share of federal funding that it deserves. Now, people still have concerns about data safety and privacy. Explain who has access to the data. 
Yeah, very, very few people. It's only uh, census staff with a need uh, or knowledge to, to have that information or have access to that information. A handful of statisticians, even even as a regional director, I don't have access to the, the data that we're collecting because I don't I don't have a need to know. So Title 13 is a federal law that was put in place back in 1954. And a lot of people don't realize this about the census. The law that allows us to collect this data also protects this data. And under that law, we can never, under any circumstances, to anyone, release any information that identifies an individual or a household. Local, state, federal law enforcement agencies can never access our data at any time for any reason. So that includes local housing authorities, IRS, Homeland Security, uh, ICE. None of them can ever access our data at any time for any reason. The data, once we collect it, it's stored internally behind our firewalls, not by a third party. It's our data that we, we store, and only those few select statisticians that will be creating the profiles of data that we release to the public have access to that. And it's important to know when we release our data, and it's released to everyone, it's at a higher level of geography than an individual in a household. We don't include names. We don't include addresses. Our data comes out at a county level or a city level or a town level or a census tract level, it can never come out at a person or household level. And every one of our census takers, every census employee, the first day on the job, they take an oath of confidentiality, whether that's they're coming on for four weeks or for, for 40 years. And that oath of confidentiality is for life. And basically, if any census employee were to release information about an individual or a household, they'll be fined up to $250,000, they'll be imprisoned up to five years. We know the public's trust is the foundation of getting a complete and accurate census, and we take that seriously. We did hear the census cutoff date was short, and is that still the case? And if so, when is it? Yes, it is. So we had the three schedules so far. So originally, the data collection was supposed to end at the end of July. And due to COVID-19, uh, the director uh, created a proposed schedule that was based upon receiving statutory relief from Congress. And that proposed schedule had data collection going through October 31st. Most recently, the director has announced that we are going to meet the date as uh, required by law, which is December 31st. That's the date in which we have to turn the apportionment accounts over to the President of the United States and to Congress. And in order to do that, data collection will end at the end of September. So September 30th will be the last day for any household across Connecticut to go online at 2020census.gov to fill it out smartphone, tablet, laptop, computer, they can call one of our toll-free telephone numbers. For English, it's 844-330-2020. If they still have that paper form lying around, please, now's the time. Fill it out, mail it back in. And and lastly, so that's self-response. And then knocking on doors will also end uh, September 30th. I want to stress, it's safe to open up your door and have that brief five-minute conversation with the census taker. So one last push then. Absolutely. I mean, when we think about what's at stake, we're asking you for five to 10 minutes, make that five to 10 minute investment for the next 10 years. Because the representation at every level of government, the federal funding that comes into your community will be based upon the 2020 census. Jeff, it's been a pleasure talking to you and we wish you and your staff a successful census 2020. Thank you for the conversation. And you can still go online and complete the census at 2020census.gov or if you still have the survey that was mailed to you, complete it and send it back before the end of September. Green Valley Tree LLC is proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week. Contact Green Valley Tree LLC for all your tree removal and plant health care needs and more. Find us at GreenValleyTreeWorks.com or call 860-234-4041. Time now for a look at some of the other stories making the headlines in the region recently. In the Connecticut Examiner, a deposit into the state's rainy day fund last week brought the balance to just over $3 billion, or 15.1% of net general fund appropriations, a record high according to Comptroller Kevin Lembo, that could be quickly depleted based on early revenue projections for fiscal year 2021. In his monthly financial update, Lembo said that his office agreed with the Office of Policy and Management forecast of a $2.07 billion general fund deficit for the 2021 fiscal year. 
The deficit projection is on the high end of possible ranges, according to Lembo, but it was appropriately cautious given the unpredictable nature of the pandemic. In the day this week, after a report about Stonington Board of Police Commissioner Robert O'Shaughnessy's controversial social media postings about gender and Black Lives Matter drew calls for his resignation from local residents, the town's three select women have been blasted by the local newspaper columnist and resident of Stonington Dave Collins for their inaction and residents have also weighed in with letters to the newspaper calling out the three women for supporting hate speech. Select Woman Cheeseborough said that after speaking with O'Shaughnessy and people who have served on the board with him, she supports him finishing his final year on the board. She asked that people attend the September 10th Board of Police Commissioners meeting to get to know O'Shaughnessy and the other board members. In the Norwich Bulletin, the Connecticut Department of Public Health issued a statement of deficiency for the Three Rivers Nursing Home in Norwich following an investigation into an ongoing outbreak of COVID-19 that has so far infected 21 residents of the facility and five staff members. The Department of Public Health said three of the residents who tested positive have died and one is hospitalised. The rest are recovering in the Three Rivers facility, segregated from other residents who have not tested positive. DPH has been investigating the outbreak since August 17th, including daily on-site visits, reviews of facility records and interviews with multiple residents and staff at the facility. The DPH investigation revealed that the COVID-19 outbreak began on July 24th when a staff member tested positive through routine weekly testing. There were serious violations found facility-wide in general infection control practices, staffing, cohorting or grouping together residents who tested positive and use of personal protective equipment. In the Middletown Press this week, Dennis House, news anchor and host of WFSB's Face the State, announced he is leaving the station after nearly three decades. Words cannot express how grateful I am to have served the great state of Connecticut as a journalist for 28 years at WFSB. The station has meant so much more to me than a job. I've grown up here. The people who work here are my family, House said in a joint statement with the station. Denise DeCenzo, House's co-anchor on the show, died last year from a heart attack and House called the special report on his colleague's death the most challenging moment of his career. He did not announce any plans for his future or reasons for his departure other than it was mutually agreed with the station. In the Chronicle, after issuing and rescinding a cease and desist order at a well-known local bar and eatery, health officials will conduct random spot checks to see if other restaurants are violating guidelines related to the pandemic. Eastern Highlands Health District Director Rob Miller said cease and desist orders were issued to Husky's Restaurant and Bar and Husky's Tavern recently and then days later rescinded. He said the two entities are separate businesses but have the same owner and staff. Miller said the violations include a lack of patrons wearing masks, lack of social distancing, lack of indoor ventilation and lack of prominent signage. And U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal and leaders of Connecticut's entertainment industry gathered outside the city's Bushnell Performing Arts Center recently to bring awareness to the plight of the state's music and event venues impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The measure that I am helping to lead, save our stages, would provide more grants and long-term loans to bridge the chasm that these venues face right now. It simply is impossible to bring people together in an audience. Blumenthal hopes the legislation he is proposing will help the entertainment industry pay their employees and stay in business. Under current reopening measures in Connecticut, no venue can have a gathering of more than 25 people inside a venue or 100 people outside. That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at connecticut-east.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East, where you can also listen to the show again on demand. And please like, follow and share on your social media platforms too. I'm Brian Scott-Smith. Thank you for listening.